Testament lesson for the sixth Sunday after Easter is from Numbers, chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. They were stoned against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, for where there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food? Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the serpent, the bronze serpent, and live. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from James, chapter 1. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. Greek 
in our gospel reading for today. What you heard is, in fact, yes, the inspired, inerrant word of God, but there are nuances from the, the original Greek text that best bring out what we should best understand from the gospel reading. And there are specifically two places where the ESV translators really didn't do the best job translating and interpreting the Greek in the Gospel reading today. The first is right away in verse 23. The ESV translates two very different Greek words into the same exact English word. Ask. That is, the ESV says, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask from the Father in my name, he will give it to you. But the ask there is two different words. So here's a better way to translate what Jesus said to his disciples. In that day you will not inquire of me at all. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whatever you request from the Father in my name, he will give it to you. You see, in the first case, where Jesus says, In that day you will not inquire of me at all, Jesus uses a word that is understood as asking for information. The apostles asked Jesus for clarification of his teaching or his actions many times. In John 13, verse 24, John and Peter asked Jesus to explain who would betray him. And then later in John 13, 36, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And then Thomas asked, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Philip asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And Judas, not the scary, but the son of James, asked the Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Or later on in John 16, all the disciples would want to ask, what is Jesus saying when he says a little while and you will see me, and again a little while and you will not see me? And because I am going to the Father. The disciples' job was to ask Jesus for clarification. But Jesus is saying there will be a day when you will no longer ask for information. You will have everything that you need. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, the time is now. The disciples have knowledge. The disciples have received that firm foundation in the knowledge of salvation. Jesus said, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. As I pointed out a number of times, the disciples have asked questions along the way. They have inquired of Jesus, and Jesus has answered them. He has taught them. Peter made the great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now they say, with united voice, we know that you know all things, and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. The disciples themselves recognize that they have that firm foundation of knowledge. That Jesus has indeed come from God. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And they don't need to ask any more questions to understand and to believe that. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. We have that same knowledge, don't we? We know that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. We don't have to ask any more questions to understand that. 
We know that he was conceived and born of a sinless son of the Blessed Virgin. We know that he does, in fact, know all things. He is omniscient. We know that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law on our behalf. We know that Jesus passively fulfilled the will of the Father for us by dying on the cross. We know that Jesus was crucified, that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of all our sins. We know that he was raised on the third day, that he ascended into heaven, as we remember on Thursday, and that he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We know all of these things, and this is the firm foundation of knowledge upon which we live. In short, we know the Catechism. And while we may still have questions about some of the details, we have a pretty firm grasp on the basics of the faith. We have heard the word of God. We have that knowledge of salvation. We don't have to inquire of Jesus to get it. We have it. We don't have to ask any more questions to attain it. Now that second place where the ESV doesn't handle the Greek very well is in Jesus' response to the disciples. <coughs> Rather than Jesus asking the question, as the ESV has, he responds and says, do you now believe? We have to understand that in the original Greek, they didn't put any punctuation. If John were writing for our modern English teachers, John would fail. Because John wrote in all capital letters, he didn't put space in between his words, and he didn't put periods or question marks at the ends of his sentences. And so that leaves us to wonder, is this supposed to be a question or a statement? Well, the ESV here sides with the King James in rendering it as a question. Jesus responded to the disciples who said that we believe that you came from God and Jesus, according to the ESV, asks, do you now believe? But rather than asking a question, saying as if he doubted the disciples, do you actually believe? Or expressing his impatience at how slow they are to believe, do you now believe? Well, the Greek can be understood as a statement, a statement of the truth. Now you do believe. The disciples said, now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And it's as if Jesus responded, yes, you're right. Now you do believe. You don't have to ask any more questions. Jesus was confirming, yes, in fact, you have that foundation. But this is only the foundation. This is only the start. As James said in the epistle lesson, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The disciples had heard the word. The disciples had the knowledge, and that is the great foundation. They didn't need to inquire for any more information, but they couldn't stop at being hearers of the word. Because if they did, they would have been deceiving themselves. And Jesus explains the danger of being merely a hearer of the word and not a doer. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The disciples had heard the words. They didn't have to inquire for any more knowledge. They had that down the side. But 
they would need to request help, aid, and encouragement from the Father. But actually, right then and there, Jesus said that they had need. Say it again. This is where we find ourselves this morning, isn't it? You know the catechism. Of course, we could all know it better, right? But you know the basics of the Christian faith. You have the answers to all the big questions. But that doesn't mean that you're done with the faith. You've heard the word, but you can't stop there. Anyone who stops simply with the knowledge that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins is like the man who looks intently at himself in a mirror, but as soon as he turns away, he forgets what he looks like. This is what we need to take away from the service today. And I'll put it in terms that seem very timely. You don't graduate from Jesus. What do I mean by that? I mean you don't outgrow your need for Jesus. You'll never get to the point where you can say, I have learned enough about Jesus, I'm good from here on out. You'll never outgrow your need to gather together with your fellow Christians in church to hear the word of God and to receive Christ's gift. You'll never graduate from Sunday morning, from Sunday school. Really, you should just move up to the adult class. We have a good time. You'll never outgrow reading your Bible at home. You'll need that as well. But more specifically, what Jesus says in John 16 is you'll never outgrow your need to pray to your Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being a doer of the word and not simply a hearer means living our lives according to the hope and the faith that is firmly resting in Jesus' death and resurrection. Of course that means that we bridle our tongue, as James said. Of course that means caring for orphans and widows, as James says. also means remaining constant in hearing the word of God, receiving his gifts, and alongside all of this, pray. When should you pray? Well, that's easy. Always. More specifically, I would recommend praying when you wake up. I would recommend you pray right before you go to sleep. I would recommend you pray before you eat. I would recommend you pray before you get in the car and drive, because that's dangerous. And if you ride a motorcycle, definitely pray. <laughs> pray before you get into your tractor. Pray before you sit down to take a test <clears throat> in school. Pray when you drop your children off at school. <coughs> pray always and without ceasing. Now, that's easy to understand. The difficulty is answering the question, what should we pray? Well, pray as simply or as eloquently as you can. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be fancy. Lord, help me study for this test with a perfect prayer for a student. <coughs> Lord, help and save my child is a perfect prayer for a parent. Jesus, grant me patience and peace is a prayer for anybody at all times. <coughs> and if you can't come up with any better words, pray the prayer that is uttered so many times throughout the scriptures, Lord, have mercy. Because that fits every occasion. Pray from your heart, but also, there's no shame in praying written prayers. As our Lord gives us one to pray, 
we can and should pray the Lord's Prayer. As we know from the Catechism, this prayer contains more than we could ever ask of our Heavenly Father. If there's anything you need, it's contained in that prayer. But also, read and pray the Psalms. They are the hymn and prayer book of the Bible. And the Psalms have a wonderful job because they can serve as the release valve for our pent-up emotions, which we, the Midwestern Americans, don't like to express. When the devil is throwing your sin in your face and you're convinced that there is no mercy or help for you, turn to Psalm 51 and pray, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Or when you're so full of joy that you can burst out, sing Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. When you feel that you're surrounded by sorrow and woe on every side, pray Psalm 121 in confidence. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scripture. Because in them are such great promises for you, and they serve as your basis as you go to the Father in prayer, asking for everything that you need, based on those blessings. <laughs> and of course, you know I have to preach a sermon on prayer, and I'm going to tell you to learn and sing the great hymns and spiritual songs from all, all ages of the church. A mighty fortress is our God, is great when we feel surrounded. Learn and pray other written prayers as well. Luther's morning prayer and evening prayer are appropriate. They are a great way to dedicate your day to the Lord and ask for his protection during the night. But whatever, whenever, and however you pray, do so according to the promised blessings of your Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his life on the cross to save you from the end. He shed his blood to redeem you and claim you as his own. As we remembered as we started the service, you are adopted and named a true heir of all his heavenly blessings. And because of this, Whatever you ask the Father in Jesus' name, that is according to Christ's promises and blessings, He will give it to you. You don't ever graduate from the church, because you don't ever graduate from Jesus. You don't outgrow your need for constant reminder of what Jesus has done for you and who He has made you to be. So don't ever be satisfied with being a mere hearer of the Word. Be one who speaks, does, and prays the word as well. So that just as Jesus said, you may ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.